Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Rocksmith Encore. Do not adjust your sets. It's Monday, and we're here live from Ubisoft Studio San Francisco in the beautiful city by the bay uh, where we've just gotten a boatload of rain, but that's not going to put a damper on our fun today. Uh, Rocksmith Encore, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is our special series of uh, streams that we do uh, about once a month and uh, generally on the last Monday of the month, and that's this Monday. Uh, that's that's where you are right now. And what we do is outside of our normal stream where we go over the weekly DLC that's come out for Rocksmith 2014 uh, Remastered, uh, what we do is we, we let one of our behind-the-scenes people come forward and talk more about something about guitar that hopefully matters to you. And one of the requests that we had recently uh, was to have our friend Brendan West, uh, who I lovingly call the Tone Chaperone, uh, talk about guitar effects. And I think this is a particularly good time to do it because, I don't know, if, did you know it's Cyber Monday? Happy Cyber Monday, Brendan. Happy Cyber Monday, Dan. Thanks. What a wonderful tradition. I'm, I'm Dan Amrick. I'm the community developer. I didn't, I didn't mention that. But uh, uh, as a result, one of the big holiday gifts for guitar people is often effects. Yes, guitar toys. So it seems like this is a good time to, uh, to go over what guitar effects are, how they work. And when I say that, we are planning to take it from uh, straight ahead, like the most basic stuff. We are not assuming that you know anything at all, that you don't currently own any effects and that you don't really understand how they work that's okay and uh because nobody knows anything until they learn it so please let us show you some of the stuff may be rudimentary to you is what i'm trying to say but to somebody out there they're like okay well now i know how that works and mm -hmm. that's who that's intended for uh keeping in mind that we also have some giveaways uh our friend uh tawny taylor uh you know her as uh, black widow tawny is our uh, our mod for this this stream and she is in the uh, chat room she will do giveaways when she darn well feels like it uh, she is armed with some Steam codes for various DLC that we've released in the past uh, that I have extra codes for. So over the course of uh, today's show, uh, keep an eye on the chat. Tawny is, as I like to say, weapons-free. She, uh, she can send those out whenever she wants, uh, but I believe there's three distinct giveaways that we'll be doing. And, uh, and you know, so there's, there's free stuff, even if you don't like anything else here. If you just like songs, then uh, perhaps you'll, you'll like the giveaways. Uh, but, Brendan, you are the Tone Chaperone for Rocksmith. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with Rocksmith? Because I, you, when I joined, you were not working in the office. You're still not working in mm -hmm. the office, but you still work with us yeah. remotely. So I was like, who's this Brendan person? Yeah. There was an issue with odor. Yeah, no, I can understand. Now, uh, <laughs> yeah. you you are in charge of creating all the tones that people yes. hear in the game. So when we say an authentic tone, yeah. So what I what I do um, is also fairly noisy. <laughs> um, so that's one of the reasons why I'm not here. So I do this remotely at my studio where I can make noise and blast sound out of studio monitors and such and do all that. Essentially, my job is um, to create a tone uh, for the player that sounds right for the part that they're playing and feels good. And um, my hope for these tones is always to create a tone which kind of... It, it, that it always feels better when you're playing it right, you know? So okay. if you're really supposed to hit the guitar hard, we try to make the tone feel good when you're hitting it hard. If you're supposed to play lightly, we try to make it like if you're playing lightly, it feels really good. And that's just one of those ways to like, it kind of helps train your ears, you know, and, um, and, and helps kind of suggest the, the proper technique in songs, you know, in a, in a, in a non-hitting-you-over-the-head kind of way. Um, and that's what I do. So there's a lot of research involved because we like to find out what did the artist use? Sure. What did they actually use? And we try to get sort of an equivalent, sonic equivalent in the game. Um, we try to be as authentic as possible where we can be with that. Um, but obviously sounding good takes yeah. precedent. Yeah. So Tone Designer has maybe oh, at least 100 effects, possibly more. Do it's, you know? It's more. I actually forget the number. It is that's why I d I, That's why I wanted to under-promise <laughs> and maybe over-deliver. Uh, but so uh, what I'm saying is if you haven't really played around with effects, Tone Designer is a good way to yep. do that. Uh, you've already bought it. Or you already have all the tones. So mm -hmm. before you go out and buy the toys, uh, you can always do some research. So yep. we're going to break that down a little bit later. Uh, but we're going to start with, uh, well, two things. One, uh, if you have questions as we go. Uh, Black Widow is watching the chat room. I am not watching the chat today, uh, but we will uh, cut away to our friends, the engineers. Uh, both Travis and Pody are here. Do you guys want to say hello on your cam? Uh, we do have the operator cam uh, operating. There they are. Yeah, they're beautiful silhouettes. Uh, with the giant screen that shows everything that we're doing. Yeah. So uh, please do uh, voice your questions. Uh, if, if possible, put them at Rocksmith Game just so that people can follow that as they get entered in. 
Uh, and then uh, Tony will cut and paste them over, and Travis will bring them up as we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, I will also be happy to try to go back and answer any questions that we don't get to live in the forums at rocksmith.com. We will keep a record of all of the, the stuff that we catch as it goes by, and uh, I have no problem going into forums like uh, late, a little bit later on this week uh, and, uh, and trying to pick up the answers to anything that we may have missed. Sure. So... We're going to start with actually the most fun, physical, real stuff possible. Yes. All right. So um, we're going to do some IRL guitar. We're right here. We have, a, <laughs> we have a physical guitar that I'm holding in my hand. It's not plugged in. And I have a cable. This is one cable. You guys are going to recognize these little plugs. It looks just like your real tone cable, but it's got this plug on both ends. Right. So if you're going to plug into an amp or an effect pedal, this is how you do it. This is when someone says, give me a guitar cable, this is what they're talking about. <laughs> Um, it is a quarter-inch tip sleeve phone cable or phono jack, depending on who you talk to. A TS cable. We can thank, I think... Um, Me, that came out of my desk. But, but, but whatever the big conglomerate was before AT&T, they developed a similar connector that was used oh. on telephone switchboards. Yes. And we borrowed it from musical instruments. Um, and and it here it is. standard. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, one of the things I love about guitar, quick tangent, uh, is that... It's ancient technology. Right. Like someone in the Civil War could probably like build a very primitive version of a guitar and it would work. Right. This I love it. It's we call that so mature primitive. technology. Yeah. yeah yes. It's great. It's great. Um, anyway, uh, so I have plugged my cable in to the guitar just like we do with the real tone cable. And now I'm going to take this business end of the cable and I'm going to plug it into my amplifier. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about amp etiquette. Um, if you don't want to get a big surprise of feedback or noise or whatever when you plug in, the best thing to do with your amp is you drop the volume or the gain control. I do both just to be safe. Plug into the front. And now I'm just going to strum, and I'm going to turn up the volume and the gain. Some amps only have a volume. Some amps have volume and gain. And we're just going to find a level that we like. So now we're here. We got a little sound. And that's how you kind of plug in. And if you're dealing with an older tube amp or something like that that just has a volume control, pretty much the only way to get distortion out of that is you got to crank it and make your neighbors very upset. Yes, there you got to make it super loud. This is not that kind of amp. And most <laughs> modern amplifiers, um, especially, uh, especially ones that are more affordable, are going to have what's called a master volume. Um, when you look at the amps in Rocksmith, every amp has a control called gain. We'll mm -hmm. go and look at that later. And that gain in Rocksmith, when you play it with sort of the amount of distortion, this is exactly the same way, but it also has a master volume that lets you decide how loud it's going to be. Right. Um, in the case of this amp, it goes from not very loud to oppressively loud. Um, and we can crank that gain up just like we would in Tone Designer. And now we got a little dirt. The gain is sort of like how hard you're driving the amp and how yeah. much signal you're putting into it. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll but talk the master about volume backs that off so that you can hear that sort of super saturated distortion sound, but at a bedroom volume. At a bedroom volume. Here's the thing about master volume amps. Essentially, they just shoved a distortion pedal into the front end of the <laughs> amp. That's really what it is, basically. Um, we're going to talk more about distortion pedals. So if I just said distortion pedal and you went, what? Don't worry, we're going to we'll go there. there. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> but I just wanted to talk a little bit about like kind of like amp etiquette and rehearsal etiquette. This is great if you're just starting out and you're like, what do I do when I plug in? The safest thing to do is drop the gain, drop the volume, plug in, and find a nice volume that works. If you just plug in with all the controls Cranked. dialed up, you're probably going to get a feedback surprise, which could sound awesome on stage, but might be kind of alarming if it's your first time plugging in. Uh, so, side question. If yeah. I, I, at home, I have a small amp head, and it's got a standby switch. Is that yes. essentially the same thing? Absolutely. Yeah, you can, you can run the, the standby switch all you want. Um, there's a lot of concern about using the standby switch with tube amps. If you're playing an amp that's like as old as your dad, yes, use the standby switch. Be very careful. Like, turn it turn the standby on so that the amp is muted before you unplug. Be very careful with it, because older amps are a little more fragile. Mm -hmm. Modern tube amps are pretty bulletproof. It is hard to break a modern tube amp. Um, so the standby switch is almost just left there as a courtesy. But it's like know. it's the same thing. It's a mute, basically, for when you're plugging in or, or, or unplugging. If you're switching yes. guitars, hit the standby if you don't want to roll down both the, the master and the gain mm -hmm. if you like where they are. Mm -hmm. But you could just hit the standby if your amp has one. Not if every amp has if one. If your amp has, has one. And we've gotten to the point where, where amplifiers are so robust that even tube amps, which you would expect to always have a standby switch, don't. Some right. of them just have an on switch. Um, 
because they've gotten uh, pretty reliable. Okay. Cool. So that's just kind of like a quick like how to plug in. If you're gonna get <laughs> if you're gonna get an amp for Christmas, you want to know. So now I'm plugged in here. Let's play with some pedals. All right. The way that I'm gonna do that is we're gonna need another cable, right? Okay. So I've got this cable. This cable's coming from my guitar. Drop those down, and we're gonna plug in another cable. And this other cable. It's like a cooking show. We've we've prepared yeah. this dish uh, beforehand. We have. We have. We're gonna plug in another cable, and this other cable, if we want to get onto this camera here, is. Let me get this red guy out of there. It's distracting. Uh, is right here. So this cable is going to our that's amplifier. That's plugging into the amp. And that's coming out of the output of this little tuner pedal. And I'm going to plug into the input. Now we're in there. Bring my volume back up to where I was. Woo. Now, if I play, nothing happens. Why? Well, it's a tuner pedal. It's on mute. If I turn the tuner pedal off, this is one of the few pedals where it's like, it when it's works on, in reverse. Yeah, yeah, when it's on, when you it's hear engaged, nothing. When it's engaged, it mutes the signal, and it just focuses on showing yeah. you w where the tuning is. Yeah, so we're just going to use this as a mute switch today, guys. Okay. So when it's on, that means we don't hear anything. So okay. we're going to turn it off, so it's doing nothing now. We're just plugged in. So now we've got our little pedal in the chain. This is great. It doesn't actually make any sound, but this is how it works. It's getting power, and it's getting power from this little power supply up here. You can also run these off of batteries sometimes, or they'll come with a little wall wart power adapter. Yeah, that's what I currently have one of those daisy chained yeah. into like nine different pedals or something at home. But let's actually plug in a pedal. And a fun pedal. A fun pedal. I mean, um, to be fair, if you don't have a tuner pedal, it's always a good investment. If you are thinking like, gee, I'd like to get something cool for my guitar for the holidays. It's a great place to start. It is a great place to start. Um, and we can talk more about it later too. But, yeah, um, it's a great place to start because honestly, um, especially when you're when you're goofing around with effects and stuff like that, uh, it's really handy to be able to mute because mm -hmm. man, when you get three or four effects pedals really rolling, you can make an awful noise. Yes, you sometimes can. it's nice to just be able to turn it off. So now I'm plugged in here, and I'm going to give this little delay pedal not really little, it's kind of big boy. I was going to say it's um, a huge delay pedal. Uh, we're going to give it power. So now we've got lights, and we'll unmute, and we've got a little delay. You have significant delay. And the fun thing about like a pedal that you're working with in, in real life, you know, that you can touch right here, is there's some cool like effecty stuff you can do. Grab the feedback way up. <laughs> Get some nice trippy stuff going on. <laughs> the know. memory boy is notorious for being oh, a, yeah. a really fun sonic palette. Yeah. This is kind of what it's what it's all about. Um, and what we've done here is there's an input, it's labeled input. You plug your guitar in there, so guitar is coming in here, and then it comes out of the output, which is labeled, and we can just chain them together. So basically, you need enough power and enough of these little tiny baby guitar connector cables. You need patch enough cables. of these, yeah, little patch cables to go from pedal to pedal, and you can create a pedal chain. And this is essentially what we do in Tone Designer, we're just doing it digitally, is we're, we're going from one effect to the other in a chain go in this direction into each pedal out to the amplifier. Okay, dumb question, serious question for me that I've always wondered. Yeah. All the inputs are on the right side of the effects and all yes. the outputs are on the left side, traditionally. Sometimes yes. you'll find them also on the top, but still even then, when the jacks are there, it's input on the right and output on the left. Yeah. This uh, freaks me out because I totally expected it to be like when I was reading uh, to go from left to right. Yes. Why is it right to left? You know, that's a great question. I don't know. I have a theory. Yes. If you don't, cause, cause in, Give in, me your theory. In, in, absence of, uh, in absence of information, I will yeah. make stuff up and hope that it might be true. Uh, it occurred to me that an awful lot of effects pedals came out of Japan. Was it mm -hmm. uh, some of that sense of, since they read right to left rather than left to right, is it that the signal flows from right to left? Or was it a convenience of many right-handed guitarists having a jack on the right hand of their guitar, well, and therefore that's the, you don't have to cross over? The interesting thing is the origin of effects pedals doesn't come from guitar. It actually comes from... Accordions. Uh, no, it comes from oh. electric organs because the first wah-wah and the first fuzz pedal effects were meant to be things that you plugged the output of your electric organ into to make okay. them sound like a horn section. Um, oh, of course. You know, and they sounded atrocious for that. They were the worst idea for that, but they worked great for guitar. Um, so I have a feeling that this is one of those things where someone had to make a choice when they were making the circuit, and they just made it this way because they did. It's possible that because, you know, 
a lot of older effects pedals, it's like you turn it upside down and you pull the back off that they worked, that like, they worked in reading inter- order left to right that way. But then when you That's turn it over, it's backwards. I'm sure the chat is totally going like, no, I've got the real story right yeah, now. Yeah, I would love to hear it stuff, because so. honestly, I'm just kind of spitballing. But um, all right, I, I didn't have mean a to feeling, derail you. I have a feeling that there is no good reason. Okay. Yeah. So don't worry about it. There's no <laughs> yeah, good reason. There's no order um, in our universe. Enjoy yeah. guitar. So now we've added our little delay pedal. I've muted here so that we don't get a pop. Let's add another effect. And what we're doing now is we're making, you know, making a little pedal board. And just How many some of these can here. you actually chain together? You can chain as many as you want. And pedal boards have gotten absurd. I mean, you know, you'll find people with dozens. Um, you run into some noise problems, and there are little, like, buffer pedals and thingies that, that supposedly help with that. Right. Um, but, yeah, you can go... Just, way overboard. Just as long as you have power and little patch cables, and little patch cables, you, you can, can just keep, keep putting going things forever. together. It may not always sound good, but there's yeah. no limit. Okay. So, so I've just plugged in a little chorus pedal that's got a nice, ah. a nice shimmer to it. It's my favorite effect of all time. I love chorus, and I love Lydian. Um, <laughs> and we can we can kind of touch these knobs, and this is something you know you can do in Tone Designer. We'll do a little window shopping. But it is always fun to really touch the knobs. Um, mm-hmm. And this is a great thing to do to go irritate your local music store, is to just oh. go in and play, man. Don't, don't, don't be ashamed. Go and do it. Be ashamed. Don't, yeah. don't do that. The, the, these people working in retail have hard enough lives. Well, I mean, you should buy <laughs> one, but you should definitely play <laughs> them play all. But play ten. <laughs> oh, yeah, without a doubt. Come on. That's why they put them out there. Um, and we've got like a little light chorus. We can crank it up. We really and, yeah, and this is dimension. Tr- yeah, and this is true of most of these effects. Is like the classic sound is going to be really subtle, and if you crank everything, you can go into really bonkers Crazy territory. Town. Yeah, you know, like that's almost like kind of like a grungy Seasick. like effect sort yeah. of thing. Um, you know, that's kind of fun. So I think we'll come back to effect pedal land a little later. Okay, but right but this now, is, basically, this is the physicality that you have. Uh, built that we've built in Tone Designer. Yeah. This is what we're simulating, just this so you can have an appreciation for... This uh, is what we're simulating. Yeah. Essentially, you're going out of your guitar, into a chain of effects, into the amplifier. Um, in Tone Designer, we have a tricky little thing where we have something called an effects loop kind of built in, yes. which is sort of an effect between the sound of the amp head and the speaker cabinet. Um, and we're not going to show that today, but okay. we, will, we will look at that a little later. Yeah. I saw a hand... Oh, that means that Travis has a question. And yeah, to go cut for away it, to man. The, uh, to the, the operator cam. Hello. What's up, operator cams? Uh, not too much. Uh, we have a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Uh, Snowmonkey99 wants to uh, uh, ask if maybe Brendan could explain uh, some of the switches on the pedals uh, the next time we get to the pedals. Yeah. Uh, and then um, Roymond wants to ask, uh, what is your favorite pedal and why is it the Miku Stomp? <laughs> <laughs> is that the Korg? That's guy? the that's the Korg Dude, that thing is pedal sick. that is uh, based on a a yeah. Japanese virtual pop star yes. named Miku. Uh, so imagine, if you will, a computer singing like a young Japanese girl, oh, except yeah. that you plug that into your guitar and you can play individual syllables, or you can program yeah. it to actually sing whatever text you put into it in Japanese. Uh, it is a very yes. specific effects pedal. Uh, yes. Our own Audrey has one, actually. She got one for uh, Dude, for a gift. That thing is super, super cool. Um, definitely very purpose-specific. I'll tell um, you why it's not my favorite. Why? Because you can't play chords. It's only for single it's notes. Monophonic, you can't yeah. do polyphony. <clears throat> and I really, I was super excited about it, and then I found out that whenever you play a chord through the Miku Stomp, it goes, me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Which just, is funny in and of itself. It just taps, like, taps out. Me, 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 me. Yeah, it just yeah. sort of like I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, but yes, that's that's way beyond the realm of specialty effects. Of what we're, yeah. we're going to be talking more about bread and butter effects today. But uh, yeah, my, my favorite is chorus. I actually brought my chorus pedal because I Ooh, love this thing so much. Yeah, this is the uh, the MXR stereo chorus, which is sort of like. Uh, well, that's a stereo pedal as well, isn't it? Kind of. Is this a redesign of this? Because it's five knobs and it's it's stereo out. This and little this little blue job chorus pedal that we put in here is the uh, budget version of that. Oh, but that just, is better. Being uh, absolutely in love with chorus yeah. to the end of my days. There we go. It's, that's where it should be for the rest of the show, please. Because, <laughs> um, I, 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 uh, it's 18 volts also, where a lot of them run on, on 9 volts. Yes. So this is an 18-volt pedal, so you need a special power supply or... You 
you mm. need the the fuel tank uh, separate output yeah. for that that you know your power supply has to supply more voltage but uh I liked uh, the. Uh, I could be very subtle with this pedal. I like having a little bit of chorus on my uh, my signal almost all the time. Yeah. But the big yellow one is the one that Slash used at the opening of Paradise City. So oh, if nothing else, uh, yeah. that's so yes. So that's my that's my favorite. Not the the, the, the as much as I find the Miku Stomp to be yeah. super funny. Well, uh, I find that to be super wonderful. To to answer the yes. question mm -hmm. as opposed to the rhetorical part of the question. <laughs> I love um, the Big Muff. I think the Big Muff oh, fuzz yeah. is great. It's ridiculous. It's wooly. It's buzzy. Um, it's a really messy fuzz sound, and we're actually going to do a fuzz tone here in a sec that's kind of similar. Um, but I love it. It's so good. Um, in fact, that's a great segue oh, is into... Um, so now we've, we've done our uh, in-real-life guitar experience here. Now we're going to go into <laughs> Tone Designer. Kay. And for some of you guys, I know you've gone in here, you've looked at the effects and been really overwhelmed. And I'm going to sure. try to give you guys a good method for window shopping in okay. Tone Designer. My favorite way to approach this, rather than trying to go in and like grab individual effects and build tones, is I actually, you know, when I go in, I want to think about a song that I really like and a sound that I like from that song in the game and just go get it. So we're going to show you how to do that. Um, so we have selected a Strokes song here. Right. Um, yeah, let's go, get that. Yeah, let's get that gameplay game. up there. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Um, we're good and where we give were. me a little volume, <laughs> and we're going to choose the fuzz lead. So you have four. Uh, naturally, when you do your job for Rocksmith, yes. you are building all the tones for all of the parts. So if rhythm guitar yes. sounds different from lead, or if lead has a section where a tone changes because somebody's mm -hmm. Uh, stomping on a pedal to give a solo more boost or more distortion, yeah. you have to do each we of those. We try to work that in. Yeah, you have to do yeah. all of those things. For so this one has a fuzz lead part. Yeah. So, and um, we're just going to kind of go through the effects, starting with the distortion effects. We're going to look at fuzz, overdrive, and distortion, starting with fuzz. But we're going to try to go through the effects. And, and like I said, we're going to do a little window shopping to, okay. uh, to see what we do. So I would like for you actually to go in and edit this tone. Okay. I'm driving with an Xbox 360 controller. Because this has got some extra stuff specific to the song. Let's go up to that 8-band EQ and get rid of it. So just All say right. remove. Remove. Yep. Boom. And then go down to that little chorus pedal that's underneath, and we're going to get rid of that too. No. I know. But <laughs> we, you know, we want to... I don't understand anything <laughs> anymore. Okay. So this is kind of the sound of that kind of Big Muff style fuzz distortion through an amp. And okay. I think it's just really yummy and messy and buzzy. I love it. That is a beautiful fuzz tone. Yeah, it's just like really wooly. Let's grab that tone and dump that down to like, I don't know, 13 or something like All that. Right. So if you take the tone down, that's going to make it more, it's going to take away the high end and it's going to make it rounder. Gets a little more kind of a oh. lo-fi, just like. I, I like that. It sounds like it's just on the border of going crazy. Yeah, yeah, And you exactly. may like the more crazy thing, but again, I like the more subtle thing, like, ooh, there's a little hint of it. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I mean, fuzz tends to be, y you hear it a lot in, like, 60s and 70s rock because, like, before there was a distortion pedal ever, uh, really kind of like a proper distortion pedal, you had a fuzz pedal because they mm -hmm. were easy to build. Um, it's literally just one component basically clipping uh it's just send too much voltage through it too much signal and a little diode will clip and it gives you this really kind of ugly distortion sound but a very desired sound it's just like so nasty you're just like Ugh. i love it i love it it's so good um, and so, yeah, let's take that up. You know, we won't do this ever with every pedal, but we want to kind of learn about, like, the gain and tone. That's good. Right there. Um, let's just take the gain all the way to the top. Oh, man. Yeah. This is probably what everybody else did, too, when they first oh, yeah. opened tone design. And now we're almost in, like, alternative ter territory. Like sure. It's kind of metally, you know, just kind yeah. of messy. Um, yeah, that's like a fuzz tone. Let's move on now. Yeah. Um, we're going to go and grab, let's grab a Tom Petty tune. Um, okay. And, uh, and get a little bit of an overdrive sound. Um, when we talk about like distortion effects, it gets kind of confusing because there's distortion that comes from your amp. There's right. distortion that comes from a pedal. And part of this is because like the history of how this happened is, um, you know, at first, 
a distorting amp was something that happened because someone just turned it up past where they really exp where the designer expected it to go. Right. And you just hear like the tubes are distorting, the speaker is distorting, the amp is like not able to keep up with the amount of signal it's trying to push out. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you get that overload because essentially you can almost think of an electrical circuit like a bucket, right? Like when it gets full, you can pour more water in, but it doesn't. But go, it, you it, don't it, get more. you don't get more bucket. You, like yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have a certain amount that you can fill, and when um, when you start to go over that amount, you make a big mess. And that's pretty much what's happening electrically in like an overdriven amp or a distortion pedal. Okay. So a lot of like our pedals, like distortion pedal and fuzz pedal, it's pedal designers are saying, hey, there's this yummy sound that an amp makes. Can we sell that in a box that right. costs a hundred bucks, basically? You know, and you don't have to turn it up to ear bleeding levels in exactly. order to get that kind of saturated distortion or overdrive sound. Yes, yes, because uh, once you take your like Fender Deluxe or whatever, you know, old school tube amp, and you crank it, that's it. Like that's the sound you're getting tonight, right. unless you go <laughs> in and change all the knobs, you know, because sure. that's not a channel switching amp. Um, so yeah, let's get into this overdrive tone. You know, so we just listened to some fuzz, which is like that really messy kind of distortion, and overdrive. This, this is one of those things where it's like, who defines the words, right? Like, there's no, like, AES society saying, this is what guitar overdrive is. You right. Know? They're very, they're very vague mean? because people perceive it differently. Yes. And so then there's infinite, like, uh, shades of yes. that color, too. So there are two schools of thought on overdrive, and they come from the perspective of people who are talking about amp sounds, the sound you get from an amp, and people who are talking about pedals. Generally, a pedal overdrive is a very specific tool that doesn't have a ton of gain, but can kind of like distort up your signal, fatten it up, make it louder to hit your tube amp harder. So you're actually like cranking the volume on that pedal to go louder into the amp. And it's sort of used as a tool to like enhance your amp's distortion, you know? And that's okay. kind of the pedal strategy for overdrive. And again, very broad strokes here. Everyone has a sure. different opinion on this. From the amp point of view, overdrive is just what happens when you turn your amp up too loud. Okay. If it's a tube amp. So the pedal helps sort of trick the amp into thinking that it's, that it's, too, it's loud. too loud. Yeah, it tricks okay. the front end of the amp. And, but for me, when I think about overdrive, I think about a sound that feels like distortion, but when I play lightly, it kind of cleans up. So, here so please notice there are no pedals <coughs> in this. This no is pedals. just the amp and the cabinet. So this is a question of where you have your amps... Yeah. Uh, uh, stuff set up. So the gain is at 70 yeah, on this Yeah, it's kind of amp. middling. You know, it's not too much. Right. And so I'm going to play a little bit here, and you can hear this is kind of like a rock distortion sound, like... But if I play lighter, it kind of cleans up. It cleans up a little bit. Like, you could use this as a clean tone. It's funny, I have friends that define clean as not too much overdrive. Exactly. Because they always want a little bit of that hair as they call it sometimes. They just want a little bit of that wooliness in there. Exactly. So, and that's just me. There's no good words to use to and, describe and musical I'm, tones. <laughs> and I'm doing this with my pick. Like, this, right. is, this, is, this to me is the definition of overdrive, is that, you know, it's like I can do a little, like, shimmery clean thing, and then if I just dig in with my pick. That's all the difference. And some people like to do it with the volume control, too. Like, yes. you can be like... It's obviously going to get quieter. Sure. That's pretty clean. That's a little distorted. Sure. But it's not like Hitch hairy. It doesn't have that like crackle of distortion. Right. Now, again, we could. I don't. I don't even know if we're having a flame war in the chat right now over what is overdrive. <laughs> don't trip. Don't trip. Uh, everybody uses their own words, but this is a good strategy. I think this applies kind of to most overdrive pedals that you'll find. Mm -hmm. And when people say things like this, Hamp has, has a nice overdrive. This is kind of what they're talking about. Um, and you can kind of go more or less in the direction of more gain or less gain, you know, with that. Okay. Um, so now we've heard, we've heard our fuzz sound. We've heard our overdrive. Let's move on and let's hear some. Oh, before we move on, Travis yes. has a question ah, from a question. our folks in the chat room. If you're just joining us, this is Rocksmith Encore. We're going over uh, Guitar Effects 101. This is uh, sort of uh, effects pedals for newbies, how effects work, and how Tone Designer simulates those effects in Rocksmith. So you have toys that you can play with in the game, but also you might uh, wind up getting some of these toys for the holidays as gifts. Don't know. So we're open to your questions, which Travis has on the operator came. Hi, Travis. Hello, hello. Um, so I have quite a few questions, but um, uh, uh, so you know, um, 
uh, we'll just get started. Um, uh, we were wondering, uh, Big Tony Purple was wondering, is there a harmonizer in Tone Designer? Um, there is not an intelligent harmonizer. Um, I, I think when, when we think about a harmonizer, we think about something like an even tide or that crazy expensive boss pedal where you like go in and say, give me this scale and play along with me. Mm -hmm. um, that's not really something, it's, it's such a rare effect and it's very difficult to implement. Yeah. So we ultimately didn't do it. There is an octave effect, octave up and octave down, and then there is another pitch effect that lets you kind of choose your interval. Um, yeah. Those are by far the most common. Um, you know, most recordings, when you hear harmonized guitar, at least on the recording, it's two parts. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of followed suit with that with the game. Um, but there are harmonizer pedals out there, and they're very neat. Um, but they're, they're spendy. They're spendy, and also they're, they're a little bit fussy because you have to go in and say, I'm going to play this scale. Please play along with me a third up or a fourth up. You kind of have to know the interval. You know, right. it's, a, it's a cool effect. Personally, I would say hire another guitar player because every, <laughs> everybody should go play a gig. Like if you, other you know, guitar like, players are often cheaper than pedals, too. Well, you know, there, well, there is that. Um, but, like, you know, the, the, the harmonizer is super cool, but it's also just fun to play in harmony with other people. Right. Yes. And we have another question. Yes, more questions. Oh, no, the mic is not working yet. But I'm sure it will. All right, okay. we'll get to some other questions. We have a minor. Uh, all right, pardon me. I'm going to cough. <coughs> There's pedals for that, too. They're called cough drops. There is. It turns off your signal for a second. Yeah, it's, it's basically it's a mute button. You make this complicated. Sorry. Um, so... <laughs> All right, we looked at fuzz, we looked at overdrive. Let's look at proper distortion. This is another one that can be a little bit uh, controversial. Contentious, yes. Yeah, because some people say, uh, people have strong opinions on how much <laughs> there is never enough distortion and you should always play louder. Just kidding. Um, but uh, let's go in, let's get a little soundy sound from the game. I have a basic question about distortion. My yes. understanding was overdrive is simply running the amp hotter than it was really designed to be. Yes. Uh, distortion is actually adding a different sound wave to your core signal. Is that true or is that incorrect? Here's the reality on what is distortion and what is fuzz and what is overdrive. In reality, distortion from the circuit point of view is just distortion. A fuzz pedal is a form of distortion. Uh, overdrive is a form of distortion. Anytime you have a pure sound coming in and you are scrunching it or doing anything like that, you're distorting that sound wave, especially when you're increasing the gain in the circuit to such a degree that it's kind of flattening out and, like I said, overfilling that bucket. Mm -hmm. It's all distortion. Now, let's go away from electronics land and look at guitar land. Okay. In guitar land, what is distortion? Distortion is, to guitarists, a very filtered, very high gain form of overdrive. Okay. That's what it is. Generally, overdrive doesn't have a lot of, like, EQ before it. Like, it's literally just your sound but overdriven, right? Like too much, you know, amp turned up, things are, you know, the circuit is overloading and that's what you're hearing or the speaker is overloading because it can't move that fast or that hard. Um, generally, distortion effects have some pre-filtering and we're actually gonna look at that right here in this effect. So, we have this filter before the distortion. Okay, this is just a, yeah. a little EQ pedal. Yeah. So you choose which frequencies get accentuated or cut. And essentially what we have is at the top we have like lower frequencies, at the bottom we have our higher frequencies. Um, when you see this HZ, that's hertz or cycles per second. So 63 hertz is down in the low E kind of like bass range. Mm -hmm. 5.7 kilohertz is way up high, almost in like shimmer of cymbals on a drum set range, you know. So this EQ pedal has a few sliders that touch a lot of the range of the guitar. And what we've done is we've turned down the bass and we've turned down the treble, right? To get even more filtering in front of our distortion. And this Marshall amp even has some filtering. And the reason why we do this is because if you don't have like a little filter before your distortion, it kind of sounds like fuzz, you know? Okay. Because you have all this low end energy that's going in and just getting amplified and amplified by, the, by that distortion circuit and it gets messy. And this, we wanted a little more crunchy. And so we have this sound. <laughs> That's like a crunchy distortion sound. Sure. It's way more messy than overdrive. And I can't clean it up with a pick. Right. It's I'm playing as light as I can, and it's still just a mess. It's just as distorted as 
when you pick hard. But again, that's about, we were talking about filtering, and that's about choosing yes. what you want to accentuate within that guitar signal, yes. and it sort of puts it in a box, and that can be a really good box. Yeah. Obviously, so much metal uses distortion. This particular example is taken from uh, Going to the Water from uh, Death Clock. From Death Clock, yeah. So, you know, this is, this is the amp doing the overdrive part of it, but mm -hmm. the EQ helping shape uh, where that, yes. uh, how much crunch goes into it. And so really you can think of, at its most basic, a distortion effect is just overdrive with even more drive. You're just okay. taking it over the edge and it doesn't clean up with the pick, it doesn't really clean up with the volume control unless you take the volume like all the way down. It's a ton of gain, right? right. You've, you're really overloading that circuit. I almost understand the <coughs> difference between fuzz overdrive and distortion now, which is one of the yeah. things that was really, I, 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 we advertised this show saying, what's the difference? You'll finally find out. Yeah. Even I found out. So thank you for explaining all that. Sure, sure. So now I think um, that kind of gives us a, and, and we're going we're gonna to look more at this filtering thing. I know that some folks are probably confused about that. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Okay. In fact, I think let's skip ahead. All right. Yeah, because um, keep an eye on that clock, yeah, too. Yeah, we're going <laughs> to skip past the dynamics, and we'll come back to dynamics and compression a little later. Okay. Let's skip into the filter world, um, and let's go to this Hailstorm song. All right. Uh, I need to uh, go find and it. And let's answer some questions. Yeah. Travis, what That's good. When I'm driving, always do that. Oops. Hey, everyone. Um, cool. So we are um, back live. Yes. Yeah. You can hear me? I can yes, hear you. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Sorry. We tried a new mic. It didn't work. Yeah, I'm back to the old one. Um, so uh, next question uh, from W. Skinny. Uh, opinion on the Boss Katana, guys. Some would say uh, it's the best affordable amp, even the best non-valve amp. What do you think? Oh, man. Like, what should I buy? Here's the thing. Um, <laughs> when, you, when you take this instrument, and you want to play it outside of Rocksmith or outside of like in your headphones if you're playing through like a amp simulator on your computer or whatever, your amplifier is half your sound. Like that's the reality. Like that's the connection between you and rock and roll or pop music is like the sound of an amplifier. Okay. So um, all I can say is there's so many recommendations out there. There's so many like do this, get that, get that. Um, go and play. Go to a music store where they'll, where they'll let you play sit down and play through an amp and try it out and see what speaks to you see what sounds good you know for me like i play a lot of um of like funk soul and rhythm and blues really simple stuff so it's like i found a fender deluxe back in the day sounded good for me and so that's what i'm going to request every time mm -hmm. is i'm or something like that you know just a simple little 110 15 or 30 watt tube combo that does that sound that gets me that kind of like clean sound and maybe a couple of pedals but obviously the music you play is going to maybe need something different but it's got to it's got to feel good you know and and I I will give this piece of advice don't buy amps based on features buy them on how they make you feel if you plug in and it feels good even if it doesn't have all the goodies don't worry about it it's got to feel musical it's got to be inspiring the same way you don't want to buy a guitar just because you're like, oh, well, I need a guitar with like a whammy bar and 8 million pickups and all this stuff. It's <laughs> like you need to hold the instrument and say, yeah, that one fit, this fits one's me. good. That's this really important because the amp, when you're talking about, especially if you're talking about playing out or being in a band, it's half the equation of how you're going to communicate with your audience and the musicians that you play with. This speaks to a larger uh, habit that I think a lot of us get into, myself included, which is I hear about a new piece of gear, I hear about <coughs> an amp or a pedal or something, and the first thing I do is I run to the internet to find out if it's good. Now, that's partly because we're talking about significant amounts of money, like the cheapest mm -hmm. quality pedals. You actually turned me on to, uh, to uh, a pedal that yeah. I was looking for that was about 50, 60 bucks. Like that's a yep. reasonable, you can find them for, for less than that and you might, yep. you might like those, but then, you know. That was you this can, guy, right? The that green was, guy. Yes, it was yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the. The greeny. The, the greeny. Overdrive. Yeah. Um, but then you get into uh, boutique pedals and stuff. They're two hundred fifty, three hundred dollars, and an amp is generally several hundred dollars. So the first thing you do is try to find some information from people that must know more than you do yeah. when it comes to amps. And yet, like I've bought things that way and been like, "Well, the internet says it's great." Yeah. No lie, I just sold a pedal today to a friend. Uh, you may know him. His name is Sam. Uh, Sam bought one of my pedals that uh, I thought was going to be the bee's knees, and I tried it with my amps and with my guitars, and I just wasn't happy with what it did. Yeah. He plugged it into his guitar and his amp, and he went, oh, my God, this is so great. Yeah. Yes, I totally, yeah, don't don't put the, this up online. I, I will buy it from you directly. So you have to trust your ears. Even if you don't know what you're doing, you have to just go, 
I like the way this one makes me feel. I famously, mm-hmm. my first amp, I bought, I wanted to get a Marshall because I loved the, the mystique of the Marshall. Yeah, right? it's big and loud. Yeah. Yeah. Crunchy. And I wound up getting a crate because of the way that it sounded. Mm-hmm. At the time, I liked it. And over time, I came to realize more about tone and went, you know what? I really wish I had gotten that Marshall. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, but, but I did trust myself and I used that amp for two or three years yep. because it was the right sound for me at that point. Mm-hmm. I was like, I like what this does. I learned a lot that way. And, you know, I ultimately got different amps, and you trade up, and you trade yes. with friends or whatever. But I did I did follow your advice, and I was happy for several years. And then the more I learned about stuff, the more I was like, oh, maybe I can I can make different decisions next time. Mm-hmm. I don't regret it. It's not like, oh, man, I was an idiot because I bought that crate. A lot <laughs> of people play through crates. They're, yeah. they're affordable. Well, here's the thing. Like, the... the you, it's got to be musical. It's got to feel good. Mm-hmm. And uh, you can trip yourself out about like, oh, features and the internet and advice and all that stuff. Or you can just sit down and ask yourself, does this sound good to me right now? That's that's really the only question you have to answer. Yep. I totally agree. Anyway, uh, enough of that. We were going to talk about filters, and we're on Hailstorm's I Get Off yeah. to demonstrate this in Tone Designer. So we just saw a distortion sound mm-hmm. um, where we use the EQ pedal in front of the distortion. What I mean by in front of the distortion is the signal from the guitar is going into that EQ first, Mm -hmm. and then it's going to the distortion. And we're going to see how... it's going to the amplifier. And then it's going to the amplifier. Which is creating the distortion. Sorry, okay. You know, it's like, um, this is a huge part of sort of modern rock guitar tone is how your sound gets treated before you distort it versus how you treat it after you distort it. So let's fire up this tone. Let's get a little volume. This is the distortion tone? Yeah, this is the the distortion tone. Going into edit. Perfect. And let's fire that up. So this is very subtle, right? Um, What I want you to do is... This is the same pedal that you had in the pre. Same pedal. You put it in the loop. This is currently happening after the distortion. I want you to go and grab that middle one, the 750. I'm going to play, and I just want you to run it up and run it down. Okay. Yeah, then run it back down. Yeah, now we're in super shred territory. Cool. So run it all the way up. All right. So this is like real. That's a, that's this is real mid range, you guys. Honky. You can feel it's like whoa, whoa, it gets really vocal. Now go down there to move. We're gonna move this pedal. We're gonna move it up all the way up. Boom! It was now that the, easy. Now the pedal is before. The distortion. Right. And now let's run that mid-range up and down. Okay. Much more subtle. Way more subtle. Way more subtle. But check this out. Now that that mid-range is gone, we got a lot of bass and a lot of treble in there. Uh-huh. We're almost in fuzz land. Like you could say that. So you're saying these tones really are related. They're all very related. So all these distortion effects and using EQ, a lot of people get confused about like, oh, I want an EQ pedal, but is an EQ pedal like the EQ on my stereo where I like turn up bass and turn up treble and get more? And the answer is sometimes. Um, <laughs> I was going to say. If you put the EQ, if, if, you're, if you're working with an equalizer that's happening after your distortion effect, so you know you could build a pedal chain and say, all right, my guitar goes into my distortion, then it goes into my EQ, and then it goes into my amp. Great. So I'm distorting my sound, and then I touch my EQ, and I start like really shaping things. You're going to get a ton of shaping power from that EQ having it after your distortion. Okay. However, you lose out on the opportunity to do a really cool thing, which is if you stick that EQ before your distortion, you can kind of decide what you want distorted. Right now, our EQ is before our distortion, and we've made this kind of a fuzzy sound. It's a little bit vintage-y. Mm-hmm. Now, let's do this. Take that 750, run it all the way up. And then we're going to go to the 63, run it all the way down. We're just going to take the bass completely out of our signal before our okay. end. And then take that 5.72, high, that's our high end, take that all the way out. Now we have created a very, very aggressive pre-distortion EQ curve. I mean, this is like pretty crazy. And we're going to hear... It sounds mid-rangey, but it's still like usable, right? Yeah. It sounds like what they call the cocked wah effect. It sounds like a wah pedal has been left in the middle, and so it's just filtering out certain frequencies. Or even like that kind of like mid-80s hair metal. You know, they did a lot of this where they wanted to get, you know, more out of their tube amps, so they kind of go real mid-rangey. Now, let's move this effect back to the middle. All right, moving back to the loop. 
So now we have this very dramatic EQ here. Super different. Yeah. Like we have made a very, very honky, very grating lo-fi sound. So where you use EQ for guitar, EQ as an effect really has two voices. And it's like, am I shaping my overall sound the way that I would if I were like touching my stereo, right? If I'm like, oh, I want more bass, I want more treble to hear more sparkle. Put your EQ after your distortion effect for that because then you can really go in and control it. But if you're like, man, I would love to just drive the front end of my amp. Maybe, you know, I feel like I've just got too much low end wooly like sound mm -hmm. in my distortion. I want to get rid of that. Put your EQ before your distortion because then you can control that. Sure. And you can, you can turn your amp into a completely different voice. I mean, if you do this trick where you take a really mid-range EQ and you shove it in front of a Vox or a Fender, it starts to take you into Marshall territory hmm. because, you know, like dirty little secret, you know, a Plexi is basically just like a hot rodded basement, mm -hmm. Fender basement. Like it's a, it's just a burly That's Fender just amp, amp history. That's not a diss. Yeah, it's not <laughs> a diss. You know, they, they, they looked at people who were like, um, playing rock and they were like, well, this basement's cool, but it's not loud enough. Let's just make a super bass band, um, right. which also existed briefly. I think. <laughs> yes, it um, did. <laughs> so, but like a Plexi, you know, has that voice, that kind of Fender voice. It's a little bit scooped. It's got a boosted bass and a boosted treble. So when you crank it, it gets real gnarly, you know, and that's why they did all these tricks with like, oh, we plug this cable into two inputs to get it brighter, to try to take it away from that fuzzy distortion, right. that kind of Fender messy overdrive sound. And then they saw that musicians were doing this. And so in the development of like the JMP and the um, uh, JCM 800, they were like, okay, let's just build in a huge mid-range peak into the front end of the amp that happens before the distortion that makes it crunchy and yummy so that when people right. plug in... They've already got that yes. sort of... They're already in the ballpark and then yes. it's just fine-tuning. And that is one of the reasons why the like single-channel JCM 800s are famously desirable for a distortion sound and loathed for a clean sound. <laughs> right. It's because it's just blank. It's just a big mid-range honk. It's a, it's a big arrow when like you run, this. When you, yeah, when you yeah. run it clean, it doesn't sound good. But right. man, when you crank it up, you're getting all that mid-range distortion and you've cut out the, the other stuff and it's just really focused and crunchy and yummy. So real quick, yeah. you, this is the difference between EQ as a pre or in your loop. Uh, most little practice amps don't have loops like i've yes. got a little vox ac4 that ain't got no loop nope uh i just can't get these kind of uh sounds in that case because my well, amp doesn't let me insert uh effects at that point most so most amplifiers most affordable amplifiers the eq on the amp the bass mid and treble control are happening after the gain after the distortion okay the so amp. this uh, you you have some control probably if you have a yeah. bass and a treble you can that's get this after, okay that's basically what this does yes and so okay. if you wanted to have that pre-gain eq control you would have to buy an eq okay of some all right sort. thank you for clarifying because yeah. i've always I've, I've wondered cool so um where do we want to go next? Oh, we want to go to questions, Let's and then some we'll questions. figure out where we go so next. Why don't we, so why don't we you skip ahead into reverb land? Okay. All let's right. answer some questions, boys. Yes, excellent. Um, so let's do a little bit of a lightning round. We're starting to uh, come to the hour. Yes. Um, okay, we'll start here. Uh, uh, Cindy Talk 1 says, if you could have only one pedal, what would it be? Uh, and in parentheses, I have the JC22. Oh, cool. Do I know what that is? I don't think I know what that is. Is is that an amp or pedal? It's all good. If I had one pedal, oh man, it would really depend on the type of gigs that I'm doing. Um, I, ooh, that's really hard. That's really hard because it's sort of a forked question. But I think it would if I'm if I'm playing stuff where I would ever need a delay pedal, I would want to have a delay pedal because they're so useful. It just expands your sound. It's really fun to play with. Right. right? It's just really fun. Um, but the most practical pedal to own is probably something along the lines of like a Tube Screamer clone, just like a simple overdrive, because it can get you into overdriving your amp more to get you like kind of a metal sound. It can get you a yummy overdrive sound. If you're not in love with your amp's overdrive, that's, that's where to start, because that's just that's the sound of pop and rock music, right. is a yummy clean tone, and then you just click in the click grit. It. You know? It's, like, it's that's funny, the thing. because I, I can answer this with this. Hey. Uh, this is actually my favorite <laughs> pedal. I brought in the, my two favorite pedals, mm -hmm. uh, just as an example. Uh, this is the uh, Electroharmonic Soul Food. This is a low-gain overdrive. Yeah. Uh, this is somewhat famous for being a really cheap knockoff 
of a uh, a good sounding cheap alternative to a highly coveted boutique pedal called the Klon Centaur. Oh my god! Uh, yeah. Th- yeah, this there's a mythos around this this pedal. Well, that, this Klon in general, like yeah. yeah. There, the, there, there's this really cool overdrive pedal that has sort of gotten so overhyped that you can't believe that it would possibly. Well, you know, it's one of those things where if you if you owned one, you'd understand, <laughs> right? So like that's it's that's that's what you see online. But this does very similar things at a fraction of the cost. It does not sound exactly like that pedal, but I was looking for something that could work as a little bit of a clean boost to add just a little bit of overdrive to my signal for when I wanted to do power pop. I yeah. really like jangly power pop, fountains of Wayne type stuff. I like this one a lot. And this is about seventy bucks. So, yeah. like that, that would be my desert island pedal. Yeah. Short answer is an overdrive pedal. Yeah. Um, yes. Let's ha- answer more, another question. More from uh, operators. Excellent. Um, uh, our uh, good friend Miles Bristow asks. Hey, Miles. Um, do you need to keep the amp on clean in order to get the effects uh, of your pedal? That's a great question. That We're is. actually going to look at that in this next one. Uh, the answer is maybe. <laughs> um, it depends on it depends on what you want. Here's the thing: distortion, as we've heard, the sound of a distorted amp really changes the sound. It crunches everything up. It makes everything loud. Even if you're not, if, even if you're playing soft, it makes it really hairy and distorted and a little woolly. Um, if you want your reverb to have that character, go for it. Um, that's a hugely popular sound mm-hmm. in a lot of like pop and indie right now is reverb pedal into the front end of an overdriven amp and the reverb tails just last forever and they're messy and lo-fi and it's like that's great but if you're like i like dream theater and i want the most shimmeriest perfectest reverb sound ever to just have my signal sound like it's coming from magical unicorn stereo land you're not going to get that by throwing your reverb in front of your distortion no you won't get that so the answer really is experiment but i think a great kind of pivot to experiment around is to treat your amplifier as kind of the middle of your signal, right? Okay. You really have your pedals that come before it, and if your amplifier has an effects loop, your pedals that come after it. If you rely on an effect pedal, like a distortion pedal for your distortion sound, treat that like your pivot. And there's before the distortion and after the distortion. Sure. Because it's the most powerful effect in your signal path if you're playing with a lot of gain. This is exactly how Tone Designer is laid out. We have a pre, we have the amp, which could be the distortion stage itself, as yes. you've you shown, and then there's the loop. So that is kind of, you know, your distortion sound or your amp itself being that pivot point is yep. kind of how Tone Designer is laid out. So Yeah. So um, why don't we... Uh, All right, so yeah, you, do, you mentioned... Do we, do we have another question, or do we want to drop in? Let's roll. We're going. All right. Let's drop in here to the overdrive tone. Okay, this is the overdrive. So we're talking about reverbs. We're going to talk point. about verb. L- lead overdrive or just uh, standard overdrive? Do, 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 do. You, you said standard overdrive oh, stan- on your list. Nope. nope. Uh, yes. Yep. Standard oh. overdrive. My apologies. It's all right. That's fine. <laughs> so let's go in and edit. Um, there's that reverb pedal between the amp head hey, it's and the a speaker digital cabinet. Verb. Yeah. And we're going to hear that. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of cleaned up. You know, it sounds pretty good. It sounds like reverb. Digital verb is always going to be like, it's going to kind of, they want to make it sound like a recording, right? Right. Let's take this and let's move it to the front end. So we're going to move it before our distortion. We might, you know, jack some settings up here too. Sure. Um, we might. Oh, it's wow. It's a lot longer. Yeah. So let's go. Much more present. Let's actually go to our amp right now. We're not going to touch the verb at all. We're going to leave the verb alone. Let's go into our amp. Let's just crank that gain up to like 80 or something like that. There so you now go. We got 80 l- or something like that. You can hear that the reverb tail gets like much more, um, it's just more dense, if that makes sense, you know? And that's kind of like really useful if you're in a, if you're in a world of kind of like that indie rock, just like. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like, you know, just really goes and it really fills out the signal a lot. Now let's take the same sound, and again, let's move that reverb pedal to after the amplifier. Okay. So we'll go, we'll grab a reverb, go to move. So now my signal is going through the amp distortion first, and then hitting the reverb. This is like cleaner. Much cleaner, much, much cleaner. less less verby. So I think that kind of addresses that Fewer question that, that Miles had, actually, is sort of like, you can do whatever you want, but there are definitely consequences to everything that goes through your distortion pedal is going to get distorted. Right. right? <laughs> so if you want it to be clean and tight, leave it after the gain stage if you can. Leave it after that distortion stage um, in the signal path. 
Um, let's see. And why don't we actually skip ahead here? Um, do we have any lightning round questions? Um, let's head over to the Chantays. Uh, yeah, for, we've uh, got... Uh, oh, for uh, Spring uh, Reverb. Yeah. Okay. So uh, as we said at the beginning of the stream, we're, we're not going to be able to get to every single question on the yeah. air, but we will, we will get try. to every single question um, after. Uh, yes. Yeah, we, 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 we always check all the question logs. Um, but this question I really love, uh, and it, it spawned a lot, of, a lot of interest in the chat. Um, SmartMouthed asked, if I was limited by a budget, what would you recommend? A cheaper guitar and a better amp, or the opposite? Mm, that is an a excellent question. A cheaper guitar question. with a better amp, or a cheap amp with a better guitar? I'm going to tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you my opinion. And my opinion, <laughs> my opinion is, is this. I think $200, $200 guitar through like an $800 tube amp is going to sound better than the other way around. Really? Way I, better. I, I now, here's oh, the yes. thing about a $200 guitar. It's going to be less fun to play, unless you're very lucky. And you're going to have to throw 100 bucks into it for setup. And even then, when you go to the store and you pick up like a Gibson or a PRS, you're going to go, oh. Like you're going to uh, have that feeling. You're going to know that your guitar is kind of like the, the than. Toyota Corolla <laughs> of guitars. But here's, <laughs> but, but here's the thing about amplifiers. Um, it kind of comes down to like a law of physics thing. Um, the amplifier has to do more at higher power and be reliable than the guitar does. And because of that, especially with tube amps, uh, there's just a law of diminishing returns. When you get much cheaper than six, seven, eight hundred bucks, you're really starting to sacrifice a lot. Now that said, um, a decent Strat through a, like a Fender Blues Junior, mm -hmm. which is definitely a compromise of an amp, can sound great. Mm -hmm. Are you going to play stadium rock on it? You could try. It's not going to sound like what you're expecting. Not without pedals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that is a great combo. And so if anybody is like, I want to upgrade my amp, then I would look at the Blues Junior. I'd look at the Vox AC, the, the, the little the AC4, a, the AC4 and the AC15, which is a little more expensive. Oh, and even look yes. at the Egnator, the Tweaker, which, That's you have, what I have, which yes. is a fantastic affordable amp. But I got I to gotta tell you this. Like my... My experience of playing like uh, a cheap Mexican Strat through a real Fender Deluxe, which is a nice tube amp, is just like, man, this amp makes this guitar sound way better than it has any right to. Uh, you know, I, I am notorious for having more guitars than any one person needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always had uh, sort of a, I had a, a compromise of an amp, uh, something that... Uh, this was after the crate. I did get a, a, a Marshall, and uh, but I couldn't afford a real tube Marshall at the time, yeah. so I got one of their hybrid ones, and it sounded more tube-like than most solid-state amps did. Uh, but ultimately, uh, like I wore it out and I beat it up a bit, and it was time to upgrade. Yeah. So I got a little, a small tube amp, a four-watt mm -hmm. tube amp, and uh, I, uh, I I could not believe that was me playing through it. Yeah. Like I and and I did not expect. And let's that. talk. Let's talk tubes really quick. We're not going to go deep into it, but. The, the, the reason why tube amps are so desirable just has to do with a particular kind of sound and density and volume and feel that they have. They just seem to feel like you're, you're interacting with your sound more. It's kind of hard to put your finger on it. There's a, lot of technical, there's a lot of technical reasons for why people think that it's that way. None of them matter. What really matters <laughs> is everybody who plays electric guitar should play through a tube amp and decide if that's the sound they want yeah. because odds are it is. Many famous players have played through solid state amps. Sure. Uh, uh, Dimebag Daryl famously yep. played through solid yeah. state heads because that was the sound he wanted. But ain't nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but um, but to, for, for me, tube, I was surprised what a revelation it was. It's it's really yummy and it's really fun. Yeah, like it's a, it's a, I can't I can't put my finger on. We why. are running out of time. We are. Uh, I mean, we can go a little bit over, but we can't go too far over. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about the Shantae's pipeline. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about we 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 sort of interrupted our reverb thing. Uh, what did you want to show about reverb? You, you, you showed digital reverb before. Yeah, and let's just show this little spring reverb. This is, this is a, a simulation, an emulation of kind of like the reverb that you have in your amp. And the way this reverb actually works is there's like little mechanical springs and a little metal tu tube thing in the back of the amp. Yeah, it's and a very physical effect, and it, I didn't know that. It is. You. If you accidentally kick, say, an amp that has a spring, uh, a reverb tank, as they're called, yes. uh, you will hear it'll, it'll make that terrible whoosh. Kind it's of a sound. It's yeah. a thunder. Yeah, it sounds yeah, it's like because you're physically kicking the springs, and you shouldn't do that. Yeah, to me, it always sounds like the thunder they use in Scooby Doo, like really lo-fi thunder. Um, this so one's yeah. for that classic surf tone. Yeah, let's grab that mix and bring it up to like 60 or something like that. All right. And if we can have a little more volume on the game, if you don't mind, gentlemen, thank you so much. 
So the difference with spring reverb and what you have on your amp versus the digital verb is the mm -hmm. digital verb is trying to sound like what you hear on a recording, right? It's like right. big, sort of enveloping, very clean sound. Spring reverb is going to be a little more... You know, it's got yeah. a little more of almost like an echoey, kind of like lo-fi right. thing, but it's part of that sound. <laughs> It just sounds. It sounds like it's going through a can, you know. Yeah. Um, so the spring reverb you hear, yeah, like even. a pipeline. Yeah. Uh, the spring reverb that you hear in your amp is very much. Um, it's a great sort of primitive reverb effect from back before digital verb existed, and the only way to get reverb was to take your instrument and play it in a big space. Yes. You know. Um, and it's very cool, but it's limited. It is kind of like it's going to give you that sound, but if. It you is the sound of surf rock. It, it's Absolutely. the sound of, of surf rock and indie and stuff like that. But if you're, if what you're hearing in your head is more contemporary and especially with more like progressive stuff, um, you might want to look at a reverb pedal. Something like uh, Electro Harmonics has their Holy Grail, and Boss has a really good like just like the basic digital reverb that's very clean and very inoffensive. Um, things like that would be something to explore if you if you want to hear that kind of like bigger sound, not in a you know in that kind of vintagey way. Right. Cool. Is so there anything else on your magic list that you'd want to do, or do we want to throw to questions? You know, I would love to... I almost feel like everything here is, like, part two, but if there's any one thing... I did... Pro you know what? I promised people that we would talk about Chorus, Fancher, and Flazer. Yes. Are you okay with, with doing a little let's, chorus? Let's move on, um, and let's go and find a chorus effect, and maybe we can answer a question while we're window shopping and tone design. All right. Uh, remember, if you are just joining us, uh, boy, you're late. <laughs> this is uh, Rocksmith Encore. We're talking mm -hmm. about uh, guitar effects and uh, the basics uh, for fe people that don't really understand the way the guitar effects work. It, it, as you can see, you can go way down the rabbit hole, and there's a lot of subjectivity in this. There's a lot of what sounds right to you. Uh, there are certain agreed-upon things that make sense to most people, but uh, there is no absolute in the world yep. of guitar effects. And so uh, uh, we've been talking about sort of uh, going over the basics of how effects work, how they affect your signal, and how to get some different sounds out of the, the core things. And we've been taking questions, and it sounds like Travis has Let's do a question. some questions for us. Yeah, that's a quick one. Um, we've got uh, Frank G14 asking, uh, please explain the difference between spring hall and plate reverb, please. Ah, yes. That's an easy one. Real sort simple. Of. So the spring reverb uh, effect in Tone Designer is an emulation of the reverb tank that you have in your amp. So most amplifiers... Uh, if it's not like a digital modeling amp, because that's made things a little more complicated, the reverb they have is actually like a little, it's literally little mechanical springs in the back and that gives you that sound. A plate reverb is another type of electromechanical reverb where uh, it was used in recording studios where you would actually have a giant steel or brass or even gold coated brass plate that was in a huge trench underneath your studio. And you would send signals, electrical signals, through this plate, and they would propagate through the plate at different speeds. Wow. And the plate would resonate based on these electrical signals being, you know, there's actually like a little transducer, like a speaker attached to one end of the plate and like a little pickup microphone thingy at the mm -hmm. other. Um, the signals will propagate through this plate mechanically. And that's going to give you like, to me, the plate reverb is the sound of the 50s and 60s. Okay. When you hear like, Frank Sinatra singing, and it's got this yummy, like, reverb sound. That's a plate. Okay. Really sought after. Difficult to emulate. Really difficult to own one because they're enormous and weigh thousands giant, of pounds. Right. Um, but, like, it's just the yummiest sound. They have two beautiful plates at Fantasy here in oh, the yeah? area. And it's just, like, such a treat to work there because you can get that real sound. Um, that's a plate reverb. And then... The hall and chamber effects are just kind of different versions of each other. Generally, a hall reverb is trying to sound like a concert hall. It's a very long reverb tail. It has a really open kind of character that you would associate with like a big concert hall or a big recital hall. A chamber reverb is more like, this is the reverb that happens when my band plays a bar, right? right. Like it's space. It's generally a shorter decay. It's a little more dense. And also just the reflections that you get are what you would associate not with a beautifully designed concert hall, but with a box. Right. So the chamber sen tends to sound like a little more ratty, but it's like totally appropriate for a lot of rock music. And unlike the hall, it doesn't doesn't sound pretentious. Right. Like I always hear a hall reverb, and I'm just like, this sounds really hi-fi and pretentious, but it's not always the right sound. Right. right. It's 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 dangerous because I've I've listened <clears throat> to some church reverbs. Sometimes there's some presets to say church. You, oh, church. And that's yeah, the yeah. idea is just like you know an, am cathedral. an amazing yeah cathedral reverb, an amazing giant 
space with a lot of hard surfaces, so you have a lot of chance for the sound to reflect. So like a mm -hmm. lot of marble, a lot of stone and wood, and uh, and things like that. And that yeah. sort of makes it like keep bouncing around and stuff. But you're right, it's a very because it's such a powerful reverb, it's such a specific reverb. You have to make sure that like you're not doing that in the wrong context. That's sure. a question of taste, though. It's so a that's question of taste. Beyond. And 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 what you know, make it sound good. All of this, just make it sound good. All right. Um, try stuff out and, and take note of what you like. So we're in the Police Message in a Bottle, which is one of the 1,100 songs available in Rocksmith. Yes. Uh, and uh, no player, to me, growing up when I did in the 80s, no player mm -hmm. typifies chorus more than uh, Andy Summers, the guitarist in the Police. Yeah. The idea of the chorus pedal is to try to simulate making it sound like more than one guitar is playing, hence the, si the name chorus, right? I mean, I think that was the bit? original sound. Um, it definitely creates some spaciousness, which is really nice. Why don't we go in, let's edit this effect, and let's really hear it. Maybe get a little more volume once we start playing. Um, let's take the mix. Okay. Put that mix up, like 80, just a little more. Okay. And I'm going to play, and I'm going to have you run the depth up. Yeah, slow, this you know. is the key to a chorus effect, is the depth. Yeah, just, you know, just run it up. See how that's kind of like watery? There's so, more warble to yeah. it. Yeah. So what a chorus effect is, is it's actually a really short delay. It's about between 10 and 50 milliseconds. Anything under 50 milliseconds of delay, which is, um, you know, whatever, 50 hundredths of a second or you know, 500 of a second or whatever. Um, anything underneath that, we don't hear it as an echo. You know, like when you play with a delay pedal, you would hear, you know, if it's a long delay, you go like chunk and you hear chunk, 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 chunk. 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 We're talking about a delay so short that you don't hear it as an echo. And instead, your brain kind of recombines the signals automatically because you're not able to perceive that echo. And you hear this layering effect or this sort of depth. Like a duplication almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's take the depth down to like, I don't know. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> you know. Take it down to zzz. Yeah, and so what we're hearing here is just like... You know, it sounds a little out of tune because the delay is also being modulated. That's what creates the chorus is the, the, the delayed sound is actually, the delay is changing its length slightly, which causes the pitch to go up and down. Just like we were messing with our delay pedal here. Sure. I was touching the delay time and it was going... This is the much more subtle version of that. Right. Um, so really all this is is just a very short delay pedal. And okay. the time, the delay time is, is moving around. It's going a little lower, it's going a little faster, it's going a little slower. Um, Let's, so let's take this and let's just grab the mix. All right, yeah, and just run that all the way down so we can hear it out. Yeah, all the way. Straight ahead, clean sound. Yeah, so that's our clean sound. And as we add it in, it's just going to start to get, yeah, keep going. We're going to take it all the way, like way up. There it is. It gets a little shimmer. And when you go really extreme, you get that warbly, like... I know that sound. That watery kind of like... And, and, and this is almost like a flanger at this point because we've taken it really extreme. Well, that's the thing. What's the, what's, what makes a flanger different than a chorus pedal? Because they are sold as yes. distinctly different units. They're sold as different effects. Uh, basically... And, and uh, you know there are there are exceptions to the rule. Basically, a flanger is exactly the same as a chorus, except the delay is shorter. It's still modulating the delay time forward and back, but it's a much shorter delay. It's like half a millisecond up to ten milliseconds. Really short delays. And uh, to give you an idea of what ten milliseconds is, ten milliseconds is how long it takes sound to travel about nine feet. Okay. So. These Super are short. very short amount of time. <laughs> like, like the speed of sound is quite fast. Right. Um, so like 10 milliseconds, again, it's not an echo. This is like a really, really low delay. Um, so a flanger is just your chorus pedal, but shorter delay, and it has some feedback in that delay signal. And essentially the, what that means is that the repeats of the delay, which we can't hear because it's so short, are actually fed back into the input. And so that's what gives that flanger that resonant sound. Why don't we load that up? Let's go into change here. Sure, okay. And we'll just keep this tone. We're going to go into mod because a flanger is a modulation pedal. Right. Um, and let's 80s go... 80s flange or... Let's go down to like... Classic flange. Yeah, classic flange. All right. Cool. Hear that... Jet plane swooshes is what it says yeah. in the description. And that's a pretty good... Turning up the depth. 
and it's going to get really extreme. I'm a robot. I'm playing like a robot. Yeah, but if you make it pretty subtle, you know, like take the depth way down and take the rate down a little bit too. That's probably good. It just adds body. There's 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 a hollowness yeah. to it, but it's that that really fast replication of the mm -hmm. of the signal. Yeah. Uh, so chorus and flange are really just permutations of a delay pedal. Okay. That's what they are. You know, it's just a modulated delay that we're working in a little bit different way. Now, phaser gets thrown in here a lot. Yeah. Um, well, they're all modulation effects, and I think that to a certain extent, yeah. people are like, well, it's the same thing, right? Yeah. It's all the same thing. A phaser is not a delay. Uh, it is different. Electrically, the way a phaser is made has to do with this crazy filter called an all-pass filter, which is a frequency-dependent delay. Um, so the delay time is different depending on the frequency of sound coming through it. Uh, yeah, we're not even going to go there. Um, but the funny thing about a phaser is that the result of a phaser that you hear is it sounds like you're moving uh, a very sharp EQ, like a notch filter, mm -hmm. you're just moving it around. Like you're grabbing right. an EQ knob and you're sliding, like I'm going from low frequencies to high frequencies. So yeah, let's hear that here. So this is the clean phaser, phaser from wherever you will go yeah. by the calling. Very simple effect. Yeah, it almost sounds like a wah. Yeah, take it all the way up. Let's the hear it up. like really extreme. Yeah, so it's a warble. Yeah, it's a warble, um, and usually the phaser is used with like a really low rate, like a really slow sound. So it's like you know, so so again, it adds that kind of like depth and movement, but not so much that it makes your guitar sound out of tune. Right. And that's the problem you're going to find with mod effects is like as you get more extreme in your settings on your modulation effects, your instrument's going to sound more out of tune. Right. You know, so that's this was something to watch out for. Phaser was extremely popular in the late '60s, early '70s, yes. and even into the '80s. I have a uh, uh, some recordings from uh, Chet Atkins and Les Paul playing together. Oh, and they and used it all the time. They used it the phaser all the time, yeah. and I was amazed because I never associated those guys with effects. Yeah. And yet here it is coming in, and the 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 word that I've always heard to describe phasers is chewy, a chewy kind of a sound. It is kind of, uh, and, and it's a and it, or it can be. Yeah, and it is a circuit that's easy to build. And okay. That's that's the uh, it's it's funny because a phaser is ultimately difficult to emulate digitally. It's one of the harder effects for us to build, but. Um, in the real world, it came long before like uh, uh, flanger and chorus effects were common because flanger and chorus effects need a delay. And back in the day, making an analog delay, well, at first it was impossible. And then <laughs> it was very difficult. You had to when use things these started, th they were yeah, impossible. Yeah, you had to use these things called bucket brigade devices, which are these crazy like a little capacitive circuit thing that can hold a bit of electricity for a little while and it would dump it to its friend, you know, and you'd have to line these up. So like it you know, you couldn't really have a chorus effect back when the first phaser pedals were built because we didn't actually have the stuff to make that. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. and really only when digital became common did ah. it, hey, we lost our thing. Um, <laughs> only when digital became common did it, did, it become an did it become possible for us to have like, oh, I can totally have a digital reverb effect and it's only 100 bucks, yay, and I can have a chorus effect and it's only 50 bucks, cool. You know, that happened because of like digital signal processing right. happened and digital delay happened and that made it cheap cool yeah man well the sign falling off the back of the wall means we're probably <laughs> done uh do we want to do we want to like do we have a best of question we want to bring no. one no not not really i All think right. what we have are probably detailed questions that yes. i'm going to need to dig into on rocksmith.com so uh we have documentation of your questions thank you for asking them thank you uh hopefully the chat room has been cool and you've enjoyed the free stuff that uh, black widow has been giving you free stuff um but uh, there was a lot more that we wanted to cover today, and we just ran out of time. You had, you had basically every major uh, effect thing, but I think covering yeah. distortion. We covered distortion. Uh, we covered modulation. Mm -hmm. uh, we covered EQ and how, like, that. honestly, that one pedal can really shape the kind of sounds that you get out of the amp. Yeah. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we I, – I know a lot of people are out there like, well, what would you buy if or what should yeah. I get if? That's still up to you. Uh, well, let me, give, let me give a little bit of Rocksmith advice, too. All right. Um, I think the <laughs> funnest way to use Tone Designer is to go in, find songs that you like to play, and grab a tone and play with it, and just take out an effect. 
and yeah. see what difference it makes. Um, and just start there. Uh, it's really fun, I think, to just window shop around Tone Designer with the songs that you already play and that you already like to play and just see what it sounds like and kind of try that. You don't need to know what the effects do. You don't need to go in and even change settings. You can really just, like I said, window shop. Just kind of go through the song list and be like, oh, yeah, I like that tune. Let's see how that worked. Right. You know, and that might tell you something like, man, I love this chorus pedal in these DLC songs. I keep seeing this chorus pedal pop up or this chorus effect. I want that. That'll kind of give you an idea of maybe the kind of sound that you're after. Yeah. Don't forget. I mean, Tone Designer has all of this stuff uh, pre-built for you. So you have you have a giant toy box in, in Tone mm -hmm. Designer, and I don't think that uh, people necessarily realize how many fun things are in there. So I, I totally agree. I think that's a great idea. Think of the songs that you really like or that have a distinctive sound. Load up the authentic tone. Start picking it apart. Start seeing what the elements of that tone are. Uh, maybe even write them down and then you know find another song that, that is similar to that or, or maybe completely different and start making notes for yourself and then you will f start to identify, I guess what I'm hearing that I like is a phaser or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what I wound up doing was just sort of like, I like that sound but I, and I recognize it from three other songs that I really like, but I still don't know what the hell it is. Uh, it, it took me a very long time to figure out the difference that, that oh, that was phaser. Mm -hmm. Like, it, w it wasn't until I got a phaser pedal that I finally went, oh, it's that sound on like every song I heard from 1975. Yes, you know? yes. Uh, so yeah, please play around with Tone Designer. Uh, you can then, of course, learn more about uh, these effects and then figure out what the real world pedals are or what options. Because again, th there are maybe 300 distortion pedals at your local guitar store right now. Yeah. Uh, many, many. Yeah. Plus, you know, like there's there's oodles of different variations where people go, I have the best way to do this. Or some pedals are purpose built. So it's like this is a chorus, but it's specifically a chorus based on this sound from this era of time. Yeah. So you can you can get as super nerdy as you possibly like. Yeah. But uh, just make sure it sounds good to you. That's what I was going to come back to. The, the touch point of all of this stuff is if it doesn't sound good to you, then it's not good for you. And it's okay to say, like, well, I don't know. I, I like that pedal, even though everybody else says it's terrible. Or I found a $20 pedal that I love, and everybody says I'm not supposed to love it because it's not expensive enough. That's okay, too. Uh, I, I actually picked up a really cheap Behringer uh, filter machine pedal that does stuff that nothing else in my collection does. Oh, I can't believe you, Dan. I know, I'm right? Scared. See, like, oh, how dare you not, like, overspend <laughs> for a boutique thing. Yeah, man. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's all in what your ears tell you, and trust them above anything that you read on the Internet, except – for any advice that Professor Brendan West gives you. So thank you so much. Thank you. For really, like this, I, I promised people that this would be demystified and hopefully uh, uh, it has been for some folks and you have a, a, a better handle on this, but you know this stuff better than anybody as our tone chaperone and I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you. So and thank uh, you guys for tuning in. Yeah, we will be back on Thursday with our normal stream. Uh, we will be doing our DLC stream. If you have not heard, this week's DLC is Holiday Hits as done by Trans-Siberian Orchestra, a progressive rock band doing really high-octane, kind of complicated versions of yeah, holiday classics. But if fun. you're, uh, I think this is the right time of year. People seem pretty excited for it. Uh, so we'll play some of those songs on Thursday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, 11 p.m. UTC. Uh, and, of course, we'll have more giveaways and fun stuff like that. So uh, please do join us back here on Twitch uh, on Thursday afternoon. Uh, Thanks again, Brendan. Yeah, thank you. I'm Dan Amrick, and uh, I've been your community developer, and we out of here. Have a lovely night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Good night.